A warm welcome and glad to have you here. Today, we will begin our study on antenna arrays. In the previous modules, we have studied individual antenna elements such as dipoles, reflectors, microstrip patch antennas and their characteristics were analyzed. The requirement for very directive antenna, especially for long distance communications, cannot be accomplished by the single element antennas that we have studied since their radiation patterns are relatively wide. Now, we know that increasing the directivity enables farther to reach farther distances. And we also know that by increasing the dimension of an irradiating element, I can increase the radiating aperture as compared to the wavelength and hence I can increase the directivity. Let us take an example to see the effect of the length of the dipole on the directivity of the dipole. This example is taken from Antenna Theory, Analysis and Design by Balanus. In this example, we see that the dipole is placed in the center here and its radiation plot on a polar plot is shown. For varying lengths of the dipole, it is observed that the beam width goes on reducing. Reduction in beam width, the 3 dB beam width, implies higher directivity. And in return, an increased directivity means increased range. In this example, here we have a plot of length varying from lambda by 50 to lambda. What happens if the length of the dipole increases beyond lambda? So let's watch that on this interesting site. I am at wolframcloud.com and on one of their demonstration projects. Here we have a three dimensional representation of the polar plot of a dipole placed along the vertical axis, the one along the blue, and at one particular normalized length, we see this three-dimensional radiation pattern, and we see the E-plane pattern on both these planes, and we see the H-plane pattern below here. Let's now increase the length of the dipole. With an increased length, we see that the beam width has narrowed. That means the directivity increases as the length has increased. Let us further increase the length and check what happens. Oh, we see that instead of a single lobe, I now have two lobes. You can see it on the E plane as well. So you have two lobes of the same dipole whose length is increased further beyond lambda. Let's increase further and see what happens. So there you go. We see that on further increase, I have additional minor lobes added. So the number of lobes are increasing as the length of the dipole increases. Let's increase it beyond. There we go. We have another additional lobe added and several other minor lobes added. One last. Okay. Now we see that we have four more added. Okay. So we have multiple lobes, multiple minor lobes and two major lobes. But the direction of the major lobe is no more as that of what it should be for a dipole. Okay. So we observed as the length of the dipole increases, there are multiple side lobes that appear. This is something that is undesirable. Hence, it is very clear that choosing to increase the length of a radiating element is definitely not a good option. Another reason why it shouldn't be done is because it is technologically inconvenient. It can end up being an inconvenient shape, too large, too bulky 
and mechanically difficult to fabricate. Well then, what is the solution? And is there any other alternative approach? The answer is, increase the electrical size of the antenna. Yes, you heard it right, electrical size and not the physical size. So in the first place, what is an electrical length? The electrical length is often used while working with transmission lines. It is expressed as a fraction of wavelength where one wavelength corresponds to 2 pi radians or 360 degrees. So if beta is the phase constant of a signal on a transmission line and L is the physical length, then the electrical length of the line in radians is given by beta L. So let's take an example to understand little more about electrical length. If we have a transmission line of say 10 centimeters long at an operating frequency, the phase constant let's say is 30 radians per meter and the wavelength is 40 centimeters. The electrical length of the transmission line can be calculated by beta L. So that comes to around 3 radians. In terms of wavelength, the electrical length beta lambda by 2 pi which is 0.48 lambda. So that's how we compute the electrical length of a transmission line. And we very well understand that antennas are also kind of transmission lines. So now, in order to increase the electrical length, we need to construct an assembly of radiating elements in a proper electrical and geometrical configuration to form an antenna array. Usually, the elements of the array are identical. The individual elements may be of any type, such as the dipoles, loops, apertures, reflectors, etc. The total field of an array is the vector superposition of the fields radiated by the individual elements. Now, this assumes that the current in each element is the same as that of the isolated elements. To provide very directive patterns, it is necessary that the fields from the elements of the array interfere constructively, that is, add in the desired direction and interfere destructively to cancel each other in the remaining space. In an array of identical elements, there are five controls that can be used to shape the overall pattern of the antenna. These are the geometrical configuration of the overall array. It can be linear, circular, spherical, rectangular, etc. The second, uh, second factor is the relative displacement between elements. Thirdly, the excitation amplitude of individual elements. Fourth, the excitation phase of each element. Finally, the relative pattern of each element. Majorly, the geometrical configurations of array antennas can be of four types. Linear array, where elements are arranged along a straight line as shown in the figure here. We have two patch antennas arranged in a straight line. Secondly, it can be a circular array where the radiating elements are arranged around a circular ring as shown in this figure. When the radiating elements are arranged over a planar surface, such as this slotted waveguide antenna array, it's called as planar array. The radiating elements, when they are arranged in such a way that they take up the shape of the surface, then such arrays are called as conformal arrays. You can see a conformal array, a printed uh, array on this semicircular shape. So these are generic geometrical configurations of array antennas. Let us now 
see a few practical examples of array antennas. On your screen, you see an array of GMRT Pune, the array of an reflector antennas used for radio astronomy. On your screen now, you see 865 MHz stubby antennas used in LoRaWAN networks. Here these antennas are crucial components which electrically, which are electrically controllable and enable significantly high security key generation rates. What you see on your screens now are the carband phase array antennas which were introduced by CECOM satellite systems in 2018 June. Now CECOM satellite systems are leading global providers of mobile auto deploying satellite antenna systems who announced the testing of its 16 by 16 sub array phased array antenna using 4x4 four four transmit and receive building block modules. These panels were developed and tested at the Center for Intelligent Antenna and Radio Systems at the University of Waterloo. The antenna will be able to track multiple satellites simultaneously and operate on the latest LEO, MEO and GEO constellations. Here now you see the BAST hybrid radio systems, which is one of the most advanced radar developed by the Russian industry during the 1990s. It uses a vertically polarized 0.9 meter diameter aperture hybrid phased array with individual per element receive path of low noise amplifiers, delivering a noise figure sighted at 3 dB similar to that of an ASA that is active electronically scanned array. Now here, this is called as hybrid radar because it, the antenna basically comprises of waveguide slot, uh, slotted antennas and also, you see here, they also comprise of an array of dipole antennas and hence it's hybrid in nature. Having understood the need and purpose of antenna arrays, and also having seen the various technological applications of antenna arrays, it's now time for us to get into little more deeper aspects of arrays. We will now look at a mathematical perspective of arrays. We will analyze the array configurations so as to arrive at different radiation patterns. By mathematical perspective, I mean that broadly we shall analyze and formulate the electric field at a distant point due to isotropic point sources for a few amplitude and phase fed conditions. Before we actually get into these mathematical formulations, I would like to discuss with you as to what are the details of what you should look forward in the forthcoming lectures on antenna arrays. Broadly, we have five topics. One is on isotropic point sources which are fed with the same amplitude and phase. Case two will be isotropic point sources fed with the same amplitude but opposite phase. The first case leads to broadside array because the radiation is broadside and the second case has a radiation which is end fire. Third case is where the, where the isotropic point sources have the same amplitude but are, in, are fed in phase quadrature. Further moving on, we shall look at n element linear arrays which have two conditions. One is for n element broadside array and secondly n element end fire array. We end this topic with pattern multiplication. Before we actually consider each of the above mentioned cases, I would like to talk with you about the arrangement of these arrays. The arrangement is going to be the same 
for all our subsequent discussions. So consider two isotropic point sources, source 1 and source 2 shown in the blue dot along the x-axis. Now both these sources lie on either side of the origin and are equidistant from the origin. The distance of separation between these two sources is d. Both these sources radiate and we are interested in the electric field at a distant point p. So R1 and R2 are the rays or you can see uh, they, uh, they can be the path of radiation towards the distant point p. Let's consider a reference path which is at the uh, which originates from the origin and that uh, that is denoted by r and makes an angle of 5 with the x axis we very well understand that the distant point of observation is in the far field of the two isotropic sources as we know all our measurements are always in the far field hence for a distant observer, you can say that the radiations from source 1 and source 2 look as if they are parallel to each other towards the distant point P. Having understood this arrangement, we shall now move on to our case 1 and as I have mentioned before, we shall consider this kind of an arrangement for all our further discussions. In case 1, we shall analyze two isotropic point sources having equal amplitudes and oscillating in the same phase. That is, currents supplied are of equal amplitudes and phase. The two point sources, source 1 and source 2 that you see on your screens, are separated by a distance d and are located symmetrically with respect to the origin of the coordinates. Here we are interested in finding the electric field intensity at a distant point P and this distant point is at a path distance of R with reference to the origin. With reference to the source 1, we define the path as R1 and with respect to source 2, we define the you know, field path as R2. R makes an angle of phi with respect to the x-axis. If we consider the distant point P to be on the right side of the origin, then we observe that source 1 is closer to point P in comparison to source 2. That is, the field due to source 1 will reach point P early as compared to the field due to source 2. In other words, the field due to source 1 leads with respect to the origin and the field due to source 2 lacks with respect to the origin. From optics, we understand that the path difference between the two isotropic antennas is d cos of phi, where d is the distance of separation along the x-axis and phi is the angle made with respect to the x-axis. On the same lines, the path difference with respect to the origin will be given by d by 2 cos of phi in either case. If the path difference is d cos phi, then the phase difference is given by beta d cos of phi and it's denoted by psi. Psi is equal to beta d cos of phi which is also equal to 2 pi by lambda d cos phi. Now, R1 and R2 are the field paths from the source to a distant point P. We will use the far field approximations for the phase terms and the amplitude terms. In all phase terms, 
R1 will be equal to R minus d by 2 cos of phi and R2 will be equal to R plus d by 2 cos of phi. For all amplitude terms, R1 will be equal to R equal to R2. Now let, let us do the mathematical analysis and find an expression for the electric field at the distant point of observation. So the total electric field at point P is given by EP which is E1 plus E2. E1 is the field due to source 1 and E2 is the field due to source 2. E1 is given by E0 e raised to minus j k r1 and e2 is given by e0 into e raised to minus j k r2. Note that here e0 is the amplitude and the field is represented in phasor form and e raised to minus j k r talks about the phase constant as well. r1 and r2 are the field distances from their point of origin to the distant point P. So apply, applying the far field approximations in R1 and R2, we have them substituted here in the phase terms. You have here R1 replaced by R minus d by 2 cos phi and R2 substituted by R plus d by 2 cos phi. Now separate the e raised to minus jkr terms outside. For the remaining portion within the bracket, we can apply the formula of Euler's law. e raised to plus j theta plus e raised to minus j theta is given by 2 cos of theta. So, we'll use that. So, I have 2 e naught e raised to minus j k r cos of k d by 2 cos of phi. Now, k d by 2 cos of phi can be written as psi by 2 where psi is the phase difference. So now what we will do is we will take magnitude of EP. Magnitude of EP will help us get rid of E raised to minus J K R term. So now I further I will take the normalization of EP. So normalizing I have the normalized EPN to be equal to cos of psi by 2. Normalizing is a factor where normally you divide it by a standard value or by the magnitude of the term. So in this case we are dividing it by magnitude of the term. So cos of psi by 2 can be written as cos pi d by 2 cos of phi. So this is the final expression for electric field intensity at a distant point P where P is a point of observation for uh, in case of two isotropic antennas which are fed in equal amplitude and phase. Having understood this, now let us uh, work on an example and see how we can plot the radiation pattern with the relations that we have just derived. So in this example, again we have two isotropic point sources and the distance of separation is lambda by 2. If I know d, I can calculate psi. So psi will be equal to kd cos phi. Substitute for d as lambda by 2. So you are left with pi cos of phi. Now, if I know psi, I and I already understand the normalized electric field expression. So Epn is equal to cos of psi by 2, which is equal to cos of pi cos of phi by 2. So once I have this relationship between phi and EPN, now we want to plot all values of EPN for varying values of phi. Phi values vary from 0 to 360 degrees. So for all values of phi, what will be the values that EPN takes? So hence we will now tabulate these values. So tabulating you have different values of phi and the mod EPN uh, tabulated. So now I will use the polar plot to plot these values. So having plotted the values on the positions of the isotropic 
uh, antennas these are positions of the ant isotropic antennas so the ones in light blue that you see here these are the plots of different values of epn for varying values of phi now join the points and you will arrive at the radiation pattern now here you observe that the maximum radiation takes place along phi equal to 90 degrees and phi equal to 270 degrees the plane containing the two antennas is along the x axis that is along 0 and 180 degrees and the minimum values are also along uh, 0 and 180 degrees by minimum values i mean minimum radiation Min, uh, minimum radiation or the null points are also at 0 and 180 degrees so this kind of a radiation where the radiation is perpendicular to the plane containing the array is called as broadside radiation and such kind of an array configuration is called as broadside array so we now realize that whenever you have two isotropic antennas or two antennas which are placed in an array configuration fed in same amplitude and phase the result is a broadside radiation so without getting into too much of mathematical uh, forms we can in simple ways plot the radiation pattern nonetheless many a time we need to also derive mathematical expressions for radiations where the uh, power received is maximum or for received power levels being minimum or in other words for maximum radiation uh, uh, points or for minimum radiation points so in order to look at those mathematical perspectives so let us take three cases first let us talk about maximum radiation maximum radiation is the is the angle of phi where you have maximum radiation like in the case that we were discussing we had maximum radiation along phi equal to 90 degrees and phi equal to 270 degrees now this we have concluded from the polar plot but if you had to mathematically prove this how would you go about doing it so i now need and need to find an expression for phi max epn is maximum when cos of pi by 2 cos phi max is equal to plus or minus 1 now who is this cos of pi by 2 cos of phi max this is nothing but epn expression itself so epn will be maximum when my phi max value is within this phi uh, phi okay so with this if i rearrange the terms i will have pi by 2 cos of phi max is equal to plus or minus n pi where n can take values from 0 to infinity so in this case phi max will have the angles of 90 degrees and 270 degrees for n equal to 0 okay likewise we now have to formulate for minimum radiation that is phi min now again we go by the same method we first consider the epn expression epn is given by cos of phi, pi by 2 cos phi now because we are finding minimum radiation we substitute phi by phi min so i'll say cos of pi by 2 cos of phi min is equal to 0 that's a minimum radiation that's the null point so now rearranging the terms i will have pi by 2 cos phi min is equal to i'm trying to generalize it so that it can be a generalized equation so if you work it out you know it's plus or minus 2n plus 1 into pi by 2 these are the conditions for which you will have cos phi min being equal to 0 so n again here takes values from 0 to infinity here if cos phi min is equal to 1 that's when n is equal to 
then you will have phi min equal to 0 and in this likewise you can find for phi min to be equal to 180 degrees. Third case is the angles of phi for which you have half power radiation. So to find half power radiation again we take the EPN equation instead of phi in the EPN equation we will say phi half power. So EPN is at half power when cos of pi by 2 cos of phi half power is equal to 0 0.707. We know that half power is given by 0 0.707. So now again rearranging the terms and trying to generalize, generalize we have pi by 2 cos of phi half power is equal to plus or minus 2n plus 1 into pi by 4 where n takes values between 0 to infinity. Now for cos of half power being equal to plus or minus half in such case when n is equal to 0 you will have half power points at 60 degrees and 120 degrees. You can tally the same with the tabulation that we just did. Let us now look at another example where the distance of separation between the two isotropic sources is lambda. In the earlier case, it was lambda by 2. As usual, we find the value of psi where psi is kd cos of phi and k is 2 pi by lambda into lambda. You are left with 2 pi cos phi. Now, my en or epn will be cos of 2 pi cos of phi. Now, having this expression, I can find the various values of the electric field for various, uh, various angles of phi, phi varying from 0 to 360 degrees. So, let's tabulate that and this is our tabulation and let's use the polar plot to plot the radiation pattern. This is the position of the isotropic sources and again you will see that we are arriving at broadside radiation. But the difference in the broadside radiation is such that we just don't have one major lobe. Uh, in the earlier case, it was bidirectional and hence we had two major lobes. Here we have four major lobes. Realize that we have already discussed this as the size of the element increases, the number of lobes increase. So here we see that there are four major lobes. And whenever you have more than one major lobe and it is a des undesirable condition, it's called, they are called as grating, grating lobes. We'll discuss about uh, grating lobes a little later in depth. So again here you see that you have radiation along the broad side and also you have radiation along the sides. Okay. So, this may not be something that is desirable. With this, we shall end part 1 of the series of lectures on antenna arrays. I would like to keep the learnings short so that it has more impact on your learnings. In the next part of the series, we will discuss two other cases wherein the two isotropic point sources are fed in same amplitude in both the cases while the phase feed is different that is in one case it is fed out of phase and in the other case it is fed in quadrature. Subsequently we shall also discuss n element linear arrays in depth. The reference material in preparation of these lecture series is as cited on your screens. Hope you enjoy learning. Do leave your comments for me to review. It is recommended that you work on the derivations along with me using your pen and paper. Take good care of yourself and your family. Stay at home. Stay safe.